Well, hey, Chapel Street Church, those of you in person and online, uh, it's great to be together to worship and to come to God and come to His Word. As you know, or maybe you don't, we're in a series called Questioning God, uh, looking at the Psalms and the questions they ask about faith, about God, about His existence, and about life. And not all the questions, but some of the key ones. And let me just say a word about our series for a minute. You know, there's a lot of talk today about those who are, quote unquote, deconstructing their faith. Uh, tearing down things they, that we used, they used, to, they used to prop them up in their faith, things they learned from their parents or they grew up with, they're questioning. And sometimes deconstruction just means demolition. It means tearing it all down and there's nothing left but rubble. And I want to talk about that for a minute. Recently I read a book by Pastor Brian Zond, and he says, you know, we should not um, freak out about doubt. Doubt can be a doorway to a deeper faith if we approach it with the right heart, with openness and humility. And I really appreciate that. He uses this image in the introduction to this book called When Everything's on Fire. And in this introduction, he says, imagine you come across a thousand-year-old fresco on an ancient monastery wall of the, of the face of Jesus. But the, the image of Christ is there, but it's covered over by centuries of grime and soot and dirt. How does the restoration project for that image happen? Well, it takes care and time. It's delicate, it's thoughtful. You, the tools for this are not a sledgehammer, a chisel, or some explosives. You destroy the image you're trying to recover. And he uses that to say, when we approach doubts and questions about our faith, we should have the same approach. The tools of reconstruction and restoration of faith in the face of doubt are not cynicism and skepticism that tear everything down and leave nothing but rubble, but rather their care, prayer, thoughtfulness, time, conversation, deep reflection. These are much better tools. And I think, in a way, the Psalms give us those kinds of tools for how to handle our questions and our doubts. And that's why we're going to the Psalms in this series called Questioning God. They give us a vocabulary and a framework for how to deal with our doubt. And there's lots of questions we could ask. There are lots of intellectual objections to Christianity, and there are lots of books written about this, apologetic books. But we're only handling some of the major spiritual or existential questions that the Psalms ask of themselves, the psalmists, and of God. And so we're going to begin uh, in Psalm 42. Some of you will know this psalm at least from the first couple of lines, but you may not know it, you may think you know it, but not know really what it's all about. So Psalm 42, let's read the psalm together. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation, and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. From the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep, as the roar of your waterfalls and your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? as with a deadly wound in my bones. My adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So some of those phrases may be familiar to you. I'm going to guess most of us know this psalm from the first couple of lines, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. There's a song we used to sing when I was in college about that. Maybe you know that song or you know those, 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 those lines. And it probably conjures up images to you like this. Images of a deer, you know, a little fawn like Bambi by a stream of water. It's gentle, it's peaceful, it's serene, drinking uh, water from a nice flowing stream or babbling brook. But the rest of the psalm, if you're paying attention, is not like that at all. It's anything but peaceful. It's not serene. The psalmist is full of turmoil, deep despair of soul. He's in a very dark and desperate place, a chaotic place. The image in his soul, he longs for peaceful streams of living water, but he's not experiencing that at all. 
He's experiencing chaos and pain and despair. Uh, it's written from the perspective of a person who's in a dark place. Now, we might even say this individual is in a kind of spiritual depression. It's not uh, new to, to anybody who's paying attention that rates of depression and anxiety are almost epidemic in our culture. They were before the coronavirus pandemic, and they have escalated since. A recent Boston University study said that in the, since 2020, March of 2020, rates of depression have tripled in our country. And the rate is even higher among adolescents, those uh, 21 and younger. Now, there's an important distinction to make between clinical depression, which requires medical diagnosis and medication and treatment, and spiritual despair or depression. They're not always the same thing. The Bible includes multiple examples of people who have battled depression of various kinds. Did you know that? The Bible is full of people who faced depression. Job, the whole book of Job, he's in despair. Moses faced it when he asked God to take his own life. These people are, are too stubborn. Elijah, when he, after the great mountaintop experience, he, he, when his life is threatened, he says, take me, there's no one left. Uh, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet and wrote a whole book called Lamentations about his despair and his desperation and depression. Even the apostle Paul was given to this at times. Psalm 42 is written by the sons of Korah. If you have your Bible, you probably notice there's a notation there, the sons of Korah. Now, who are the sons of Korah? Well, we find out about them in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 19. They're ancient song leaders in Israel. So their job was to lead God's people in singing songs of praise and worship. And they wrote these songs, and some of them are recorded and included for us in the Psalms. Psalm 42 is the first psalm in what we call the second book of Psalms. There's five sections or books of the Psalms. Psalm 42 is the first in the second book. It's called a maskil. I don't know if you caught that in your Bible. You might see M-A-S-K-I-L. Scholars debate what this means, but most agree that this is a term of instruction. So the Psalms are given to us not only to teach us to praise, but also to instruct us. Now I want you to pause for a minute and think about what I just said. These ancient song leaders, worship leaders, who wrote songs of praise and worship, wrote a song about depression. And it's included in the Psalms, which means it's meant to be sung. Can you imagine coming to church and we sing a song about spiritual depression? That sounds crazy. But it's there for a reason, to instruct us, to give us a vocabulary, to help us. Living in the Psalms, I think, helps us sort of swim in the waters of a different kind of language. We absorb a way to think about pain and difficulty differently. The psalmists are, are ruthlessly honest about their pain, and then they say these crazy off-the-wall things that are filled with hope right in the midst of their pain. It's strange, but you know, trying to follow a sovereign and loving God in a world of brokenness is a strange thing. And so the psalms are given to help us in that. Okay, so in terms of Psalm 42, I want to look at what's happening outside the psalmist, what's happening inside the psalmist, and then what he does about what's happening to him and what we can learn to do when we face these things as well. So apparently this psalmist is, he is um, outside or distant from the people of God. He's in the far north regions of, of Israel. In verse 6, we're told that... Um, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon. Mount Hermon is on the northern edge of Israel today, on the Syrian border. So he's far away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of worship for the Jewish people. So he's physically distant from God, the center of worship, and he feels spiritually distant from God as well. Let me talk about this in, in terms of the external oppression that he's facing. His external oppression. Now, we're not given specifics, but it seems like the psalmist is facing things externally that make him feel abandoned. And we get this inkling about this when he says that people are taunting him, his adversaries, saying, where is your God? So we see this in verses 3 and verses 9 through 10. My tears, he says, have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? This is the taunt that shows up over and over again. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? So in verse 9, he feels forgotten, and we go to verse 10. Why do, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. So their taunts, their, their verbal taunts to him about where is your God feel like a wound in his bones. When they say to me all day long, where is your God? There it is again. That's a key question that he's being asked from outside and that he's asking internally as well. 
he feels forgotten by God. And whatever's going on in his life, it looks to others as if he has been abandoned by God. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe you've asked internally or had people say, well, where is your God now in the midst of this diagnosis or in the midst of this loss or this pain or this disappointment? Where is your God? What good is your faith in the face of this despair? That's what he's asking internally and externally is facing. And this brings us to his internal despair. Internal despair. So external oppression, internal despair. All that's going on around him, pain, disappointment, and the mocking questions of others have put him in a very dark hole of internal spiritual despair and even depression. Look at verses 5 through 7. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? These are interesting phrases. Cast down, turmoil within Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. There's that crazy off-the-wall words of hope in the midst of despair we talked about. My soul is, again, cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. I want to pause here and talk about what's going on, what he's saying here in verse 7 particularly. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why in turmoil within me? This is the question that's repeated in verse 11. It's the, it's the question that frames the whole psalm. What's happening to me? What's going on inside of me? In verse 3, we're told that he's on the verge of tears all the time. Tears are my food day and night, he says. What he means is he's on the verge of a breakdown constantly. Have you ever felt that way? Like, it doesn't take much to put you over the edge. You're hanging on by a thin thread. And even simple things you blow up over because you're just, you feel like you're, you're on a, living on a frayed edge. And anything could, could break you. That's the image here of the psalmist. And again, this is a psalm given to us to sing, to pray, to learn from. Maybe that would encourage you if you feel that way right now. You're just weary and worn out and on, a, on an edge. You feel like you're on the, burst, on the verge of bursting into tears. He describes his condition in verse 7 as though it feels like he's drowning. Waterfalls, waves, breakers are washing over him, and he feels like he can barely keep his head above water, that he's, he's going under. And if you've talked to somebody who's facing depression, grief, anxiety, fear, as I have, or if you've been there yourself, it does feel like waves, doesn't it? It can feel like just wave after wave of these things come over you, and you're drowning in despair. The imagery here used is very, very interesting. When he uses imagery of waves and breakers and waterfalls, um, the, the, it's an image of the, the, the sea or the ocean or the abyss. We go back one slide. He's talking about, um, in Hebrew imagery, the abyss, the sea, the ocean, is being in a dark place, a desperate place, a dangerous place. So the ancient Israelites were not seafaring people, meaning they didn't see the ocean as joyful and fun. They feared it. In fact, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, references to the sea are often references of darkness, despair, evil, um, to be avoided. Contrast that with the images of flowing water, streams of living water, rivers that make glad the city of God, and so on. There's a key distinction here. So he's talking about he longs to be like a deer by a stream of water, but he feels like he's sinking into the abyss. And that's important for us to grasp what's happening here. Yet for all of this, the psalmist is still holding on. He's still clinging to faith. Notice what he says. He says, your waterfalls, your breakers, your waves have gone over me. He's clinging to the belief that God is somehow, in the midst of his despair, sovereign. That God is somehow in control. He, he sees these as, he calls them, they're coming from you, God. Now, he doesn't necessarily mean, nor do we believe, that God causes every calamity to come upon you. But he sees himself in God's hand, or trying to, he's fighting for this, in the midst of his despair. That God has not abandoned him. I came across this image of a painting you saw a moment ago, I'm going to show it to you now. When I was studying for this, this sermon. And I think this image captures what's happening in verse 7 of the psalm better than, than my words could. Sinking into the abyss, in the darkness, in the deep, wave after wave rolling over you. And yet, little glimpses of light and hope. 
This phrase, deep calling to deep, out of the abyss. If you've been in the ocean uh, when the big waves come rolling in, it can be fun if you do one of two things. If you're on top of the waves, on a surfboard or something, flo a flotation device, or you catch them at the right momentum and they carry you, or if you dive deep down underneath where you're safe and they roll over you. But if you're somewhere in between, it's terrifying, and it can be disorienting, and it can <laughs> hurt you. I've experienced that. So throughout the psalm, there's this clear sense that the psalmist longs to praise God again. He keeps saying, I will yet praise you. I will again praise you. What he means is he's not praising God now. He's in the abyss, but he wants to. And did you catch, this is how the psalm ends. It ends in verse 11, for I shall again praise you, my God. Meaning, I'm not right now. I'm not where I want to be, and the psalm ends. It doesn't resolve neatly. It leaves us with the psalmist fighting, as it were, for faith and for hope. In fact, it goes on. Psalm 43 is a continuation of Psalm 42, and the same line is repeated, and Psalm 43 ends with the very same verse. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why in trauma within me? But I shall again praise him, looking forward in hope, fighting, as it were, for hope. I, I think psalms like this are in the Bible, for us to learn from, to, to learn this kind of, to equip us so when the breakers and the waves wash over your life, you know what to do. You know how to respond. You have the resources and tools to deal with it. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Doesn't mean it isn't hard. Doesn't mean you don't feel like you're being, you're, you're going under. But you have, you have something to turn to, someone to cling to. How do you handle pain and difficulty in your life? What do you do? How, how, do we do, how do people deal with despair and waves of difficulty and, and pain? Do you phone a friend? It's not a bad thing to do. Some people, do you buy a bottle? It's not a good thing to do. Do you just withdraw into yourself and hide away? What, what do you do? Do you freak out on social media? Do you leak out in, in unhealthy ways? We, we all find some coping mechanism, and I think the Psalms are given to us that we might know how rightly to handle it when the, wa the bra waves and the breakers are washing over us. Okay, so what can we learn from the psalmist? Three things that we see in the psalm that we can do in these moments when it comes to us. And frankly, even if you're not there, even if you're listening to this going, I don't feel like I'm in a dark hole, I don't feel like I'm in, de in a depression. In case you're with somebody that you love who is there, how can you support them, pray for them, and encourage them? Number one, pour out your soul. Pour out your soul. This is what the psalmist has been doing, and it means being brutally honest with where you are. You know, we all, almost, we almost can't help this. We subconsciously temper and measure and filter our words based on who we're with. You do it and I do it. You speak certain ways in church that you don't maybe at home with your family or at work or when you're out with friends. We, we sort of subconsciously have a filter that ch we, we want to say certain things in certain company because based on the relationship. Do I trust them enough to be brutally honest? Do I know them well enough to tell them what's really going on in my life? I'll never forget years ago walking into church and I saw a friend who I knew kind of casually in church and I said, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And he stopped and stared me right in the eyes and says, do you really want to know? And I went, uh, I think so, yeah. And he unpacked some really painful stuff. And he said, I'm just tired of pretending. So I figured the next person that asks me that question, I'm going to be honest. And sorry, Pastor Jeff, you happen to be that guy. I think we do this. We filter and we pretend and we measure our words. What the psalmist is doing here and what we need to learn to do is to be unfiltered before God. Wouldn't it be good and great, some of you know this, to have a friend that you could unpack your soul, pour out your soul with. You don't have to measure anything. You can trust them with whatever you say. Even if it's way over the top, even if you're in a dark place, they're not going to leave you. They're not going to freak out. They're not going to say, this is too much for me. They're going to sit with you in it. Well, what we're being told here is you do have that friend. You have that friend in God. That's what the psalmist is modeling for us. You have that kind of friend, even if pouring out your soul means shaking your fist at him, expressing your anger at him, or your doubts or questions about him. Notice that part of what this looks like for the psalmist is asking the question, why? He repeatedly asks questions of, of why. Why have you forgotten me, he says to God. And then he repeatedly says, why are you cast down, O my soul? So there's two kinds of why questions. There's the why to God, which we all ask, even internally, if we don't say it. 
But there's the follow-up question of why am I reacting this way? What's, what, what's happening to me in my soul? Why are you downcast? And honestly, this is the real work of deconstruction. Deconstructing not just God from a distance. I object to this, I don't like this, it doesn't fit with my sensibilities. Or, what's happening in me? Why am I feeling and reacting this way? Frankly, it's easier to ask the why questions of God from a distance than it is to ask the why questions of ourselves. It's painful. And I do believe if we ask questions, the why question of God, he will bring us to the why question of our own soul. And the psalmist does both here. So he pours out his soul. Look at verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, unfiltered, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise and a multitude-keeping festival. He's remembering something. We'll get back to that. But these things I remember as I pour out my soul. So he's looking back at what it used to be like in the midst of it not being like that at all and pouring out his soul about his condition. Second thing he does, and we must do, preach to yourself. I've said this before, learning to speak and teach and preach to your own soul is a crucial part of growing in spiritual maturity. You know, it's fascinating. There are points in the psalm where the author is not talking to God. And he's not talking to us or the congregation or the audience. He's talking to himself. He's talking to his soul. You ever talk to your soul? Sounds strange, doesn't it? How do you do that? I said to my soul, soul? He like to said to myself. He's addressing himself, which is crucial. I'm going to read to you an excerpt from Martin Lloyd-Jones' quote, and then I'm going to lead into the quote the, 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 that you'll see on the screen here. Uh, this is I read this years ago. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached in London in the previous generation, and there's a collection of 21 sermons of his called uh, Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Its Cures. They're all dealing with psalms like this and this issue in the scriptures. It's a fascinating read. Here's what he writes about spiritual depression from Psalm 42. He says, The first thing we have to learn is what the psalmist learned. We must learn to take ourselves in hand. He is talking to himself. He's addressing himself. It's important to see that this is not the same as morbidity and introspection. We must talk to ourselves instead of allowing ourselves to talk to us. In spiritual depression, we allow our self-talk to us instead of talking to ourself. Am I being deliberately paradoxical? Far from it, he says. This is the very essence of wisdom in this matter. Now, here's the quote. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? The psalmist's treatment was this. He starts talking to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, he asks. His soul has been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, Self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. I love that. This is the essence of wisdom, Lloyd-Jones says. Learning how to address yourself. He's been listening to himself and it's bringing him down. And now he decides, no, no, I have some things to say to you, soul. I want you to listen for a minute, soul, even though he doesn't feel them necessarily in that moment. He rightly says, this is the very essence of spiritual wisdom. Look at verses 5 and 11 once more. Why are you cast down, O my soul? There's the why question again, right? Why are you cast down? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. He's speaking to himself now, my salvation. And again, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. My salvation, he's reminding himself, and my God. He's asking the question and following it up with, by addressing himself in this way, speaking to his own soul. He's repeatedly asking himself a question and then speaking words of faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm much better at telling myself bad news. I'm not an easily discouraged person, uh, but I still, my, my, I go right to the bad news. I'm really good at reminding myself of the reasons we have to fear, of what could go wrong, of what is uncertain, of why this might not work out, of what has happened in the past that isn't good. Are you like that? I, I'm good at preaching bad news to myself, but what we're told here is what we need to learn to do is to pause and to say, okay, okay, I've listened enough, soul. Now I have something to say to you. And it's not based on what I've seen or what I think or what I feel. It's based on what I know, what God has said to me. I want to preach some good news to you, soul. 
If you're coming to church, you're tuning in to church, and all you get is once a week or twice a, twice a month a sermon, that's not enough good news. You need to learn to daily preach and talk to yourself about what the truth is, what the good news is. And by the way, this is not the same thing as cognitive behavioral therapy or positive self-talk. This is far more ancient and nuanced because what you're doing as a follower of Jesus, as a believer in God, the God of the Bible, is you're saying these things to your soul in the presence of God so that he then will begin to address your soul. You're like sort of prompting it. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. So God's spirit speaking to my spirit and with my spirit that I'm his child because sometimes I don't believe it. Sometimes I doubt it. As a matter of fact, I think Romans chapter 8 might be the best place for you to learn how to preach to yourself. Let me just read a couple excerpts for you. It won't be on the screen, but if you, if you, you can go there on your own. Read Romans 8. What shall we say to these things, soul? If God's for me, who can be against me, soul? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things, soul? Who should bring any charge against me, self? But it's God who justifies. Who is to condemn Christ Jesus who died for me, soul? For not all these things were more than conquerors, my soul. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth can ever separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You could do a lot worse than just working your way through Romans chapter 8 and preaching these things to yourself. Over, as a matter of fact, we're going to do a whole series on Romans chapter 8, which may be the greatest chapter in all the New Testament after Easter. So stay tuned on that one. Okay. So, he pours out his soul. He preaches to himself. The, speaking the truth to himself. Your feelings are, are not the cause of your a uh, 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 result of your circumstances. We tend to think I feel this way or my emotional state is caused by my circumstances. The truth is, I feel a certain way, not because of what has happened to me, but because of what I'm telling myself based on what has happened to me. And that's not popular psychology. That's ancient spiritual wisdom. So preaching to yourself in the presence of God. Now one more thing it is, he's remembering this is also in uh, preaching to yourself. He, repeatedly, the psalmist says, I'm remembering certain things. In verse 4, I remember how it was with the sacred assembly. I remember when I sang shouts of praise and songs of joy. I'm not now. I want to be, but I remember that. This is not just nostalgia. So it's not like, remember how awesome it was in high school? What good is that? It's, oh, it's over and gone. It's past. It's saying God was real there then. And I knew it, even though I don't feel it in this moment. Which is more real? The experience you once had with God when you felt his pleasure and joy or your present moment of doubt and question and despair? How do you know? I think at the present moment we can be confused, misled, deceived into thinking this is all there is and this is real. So part of what it means to preach to yourself is to preach the truth from God's word and also to remember the moments when God was present with you. You felt his presence and joy. And that's what he's doing. God was real there then, got great spiritual power in remembering. So there's a crucial difference, friends, between listening to yourself and talking to yourself, and we need to learn the difference. In fact, for those of you who've come out the other side of a spiritual depression, you, you remember what that was like, that dark hole of despair, and you've come out the other side. What would you now say to yourself back then? What did you need to hear? What would you preach to yourself then? That's a great question to ponder. It's what we're doing here in Psalm 42. Okay, last, the third thing he does is fight for hope. One of the things that I love about this psalm is that throughout there is this clear sense you get that the psalmist is fighting for the status of his own soul. He's clinging on to hope, fighting within himself for hope in God, fighting for hope that he will one day again praise him. A good friend of mine said, it's okay not to want to, but it's good to want to want to. Meaning, I can't praise him right now. I can't find the words of joy. I don't even sometimes want to, but I want to want to. I long to be in that place, even though I'm not sure how I'm going to get there. So he's fighting for hope, and so can we in the midst of it. Look at verses 8 and 11. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night 
his song is with me at night, meaning in the darkness, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. This is fascinating to me. I've been thinking about this and praying about this. So the psalmist is saying, in the midst of my despair, in the dark pit that I'm in, God's steadfast love is with me. And then he says, his song is with me. This may be the most hopeful verse in the entire psalm. What does he mean? God's song somehow is a tune he can still faintly hear in the darkness, in the depths. And that song of God has become to him a prayer to the God of his life. What song is that? Well, frankly, we're studying it. We're studying the songs. The psalms are the songs, the prayers of God's people. And that's why we should be reading them and praying them and singing them. In my own family, I remember vividly when my mother-in-law passed away from pancreatic cancer and my father-in-law did then and does now cling to the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And that song has thematic connections, imagery, to this psalm. When sorrows like sea billows roll, the hymn says, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So in the, in the pit, in the depths, when the roar of the waves is breaking and you can, but there's still this faint hint of the tune, the song of God's love, his steadfast love is still there. And that song becomes a prayer offered back to God, whose song it is. Like praying until you learn to pray. Do you know what that means? There's the phrase, deep calls to deep. I think this is what he, I think this song of God within him is what that means. The depth of my despair in my soul calling to the depth of your love um, based on the words that you've given me, your song. It's become a prayer back to you, God. I'm going to go back to that image of the painting as we close. And I'm going to read to you what the artist writes about this painting. In this image, the darkness and waves all but engulf the floundering individual framed at the bottom. Both the, the person's size and position are intended to evoke a sense of abandonment and desperation that we hear from the psalmist in Psalm 42. However, standing over the darkness and chaos of the storm is a single point of not quite eclipsed light. This light, which is in the sufferer's direct line of sight, alludes to the hope the psalmist clings to even in his separation from the Lord's presence. Though it is night, though it is dark, God still gives his people a song, a prayer to their God that ends with a hopeful refrain, I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And you know, we, we as followers of Jesus, looking back through the resurrection of the cross to this psalm, have a unique kind of hope. Because we worship and serve and follow a Savior who has gone to the depths for us who knows what it is to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's no emotion or, or experience in Psalm 42 that Jesus has not plumbed the depths of for you. So when you fight for hope, what you're really doing is clinging to him. He's been there and he's with you there. And if you have people in your life that are there right now, questioning, doubting, feeling disoriented, he, Jesus wants to send you there to be with them, to teach them, pour out your soul, Speak words of life and truth to yourself and fight for hope clinging to him. Let's pray. Father God, I know that you know every one of our hearts and our souls intimately. You know us better than we know ourselves. And we, like the psalmist here, we desperately long to cling to hope in you. We long to be returned and restored to the place where we sing songs of praise and shouts of joy, but some of us aren't in that place. Some of us are in the pit, we're in the depths, and we feel like we're barely keeping our heads above water. Jesus, you see us. You see us and you come to meet us there because you've been there. And you will fight with us and for us as we cling to hope in you. We thank you. We praise you in your name. Amen.